Scientific family. You all are doing amazing work, and I really appreciate the opportunity to meet with you today and to talk about my research and work on endangered languages. I thought it would be appropriate to start this presentation by teaching you all a word in an endangered language. And I know many of you are language teachers, so I wonder if you could say with me, Kaplaya. Kaplaya. This is a wonderful greeting in the Koro language of India. To give you a sense of what Koro sounds like, I would like to play a short video clip. This is a woman named Abamu Degio, and she's singing in the Koro language of India. If you see a small pause during the video clip, don't worry. This session is being recorded, and you'll be able to access it later. So this is the Koro language of India, one of the many beautiful languages that I've encountered in my travels. So that was Koro, and Koro represents just a tiny fraction of the linguistic diversity found in the world. And we have an amazing amount of linguistic diversity just right here in this webinar. I noticed we have participants from Thailand, Sweden, Malta, Ukraine, India, Peru, Colombia, Brazil, Vietnam, Georgia, Romania, Poland. I wish I could greet each of you in your respective languages. We estimate that there are more than 7,000 languages spoken in the world today. And many people are surprised when they see this number. We also estimate that half of the world's languages are going to go extinct in this century and are endangered. So I would like to talk to you today about my personal journey as a scientist and a linguist, about some of the amazing people I've met around the world, people that I call language warriors. And I'd like to talk about why languages are going extinct. What are some of the local and global forces that are pushing languages into extinction? Secondly, why does it matter? Uh, you are all language teachers. You're doing amazing work expanding your students' minds by teaching them languages. You all know the value and the gift of being a bilingual person. But many people are not convinced of the value of linguistic diversity, so we have to think about why it matters. Why do we need 7,000 languages in the world? Are they an impediment to communication among humans, or are they perhaps humanity's greatest intellectual heritage? Then I'd like to talk a little bit about where languages are going extinct, and I will invite you to join me at different locations around the world, and we'll look at specific case studies and scenarios of language endangerment. And in each of those case studies, we'll have an opportunity to think about what people are doing strategically to save their languages. The world's languages are very unevenly distributed with respect to population. And on this slide, I'd like to show you on the left an inverted pyramid representing the world's languages, and on the right, a pyramid representing the world's population. The 85 biggest languages of the world represent about 79% of the world's population. Then we have a group of medium-sized languages, approximately 3,000, and those represent about 21% of the world's population. And finally, we have the majority of the world's languages, more than 3,500, and they represent just 0.1% of the world's population. And this is an accelerating trend and it helps to explain why people who speak these languages or study them feel a sense of urgency. People have wondered whether language extinction is similar to species extinction. They're not the same thing, of course, but they are parallel processes that are playing out, and there are some interesting connections between them. The first thing I would point out is simply that languages are much more endangered than species. You can see that something like 18% of mammals and 11% of birds are endangered, 
but for languages that figure is more than 40 percent. A second parallel I would point out is that we are in a similar state of scientific knowledge with respect to languages as we are to species. What do I mean by that? If you talk to a biologist, they will tell you that something like 80 percent of the plant and animal species that are thought to exist in the world have not yet been named or classified or documented within a scientific framework. Similarly, we do not have a scientific documentation of more than perhaps 10 percent of the world's languages. So we're in a similar state of knowledges, knowledge for languages and for biodiversity. Finally, when I said that 80 percent of plant and animal species were not documented by science, that doesn't mean that they're unknown to people. And so it turns out that much and perhaps even the majority of knowledge that humans possess about the environment, about plants and animals, is knowledge that is only found in small languages that are themselves endangered. So it turns out there is a very deep connection between biodiversity, which we all care deeply about, and linguistic diversity. Now, you don't have to take my word for it, but you could talk to someone like Mr. Anselon Seru, shown here, who lives on the very small island of Futuna in the South Pacific. Anselon is an expert fisherman, and he can name more than 250 species of fish that swim around his island. Or you could talk to Ilarion Zamos Kondori from Bolivia. He's a speaker of the Kalawaya language, and his people, who are traditional healers, no more than 1,200 medicinal plants and their properties and curative uses. So these two represent some of the immense knowledge base about the natural world that is found in small and endangered languages and is not written down or recorded anywhere and is not known to science. In thinking about language diversity, it would be useful to have some kind of metric or measure. How do we measure language diversity? One way you could measure it is simply by counting the number of languages spoken in a given community or in a country. And so I'd like to come, for sake of comparison, I'd like to compare two different regions of the world. On the left, we have Bolivia, which is a relatively small South American country with a population of about 12 million people. And on the right, we have Europe, which is a very large region made up of many countries something like 180 million people. And if we look superficially, we see that Europe has more languages. Europe has 164 languages spoken in it. Bolivia seems to have fewer languages. It has only 37 languages. But if we look at another level of diversity, the level of language families, and by language family, I mean a group of related languages, like the Romance languages, which includes Portuguese, Romanian, French, Italian, uh, or the Germanic languages, English, Dutch, Frisian. If we look at the level of language families, we see that Bolivia has 18 language families, which is the same number that Europe has. So if we think about diversity as being not just the number of languages, but the number of language families, Bolivia is much more diverse than Europe. And so if we're interested in understanding language diversity, we might choose to go to a place like Bolivia rather than to Europe to see what diversity really means. And so the case studies that I will be presenting to you today come from these super diverse linguistic regions of the world. I have called these language hotspots and I published this first attempt at mapping the world's language hotspots in National Geographic magazine in 2007. And since that time, my team and I have been very busy identifying language hotspots around the world, visiting as many of the hotspots as we can, and in those hotspots, meeting with some of the last speakers of the most endangered languages in the world, making recordings of their languages, and sharing um, some of the knowledge that they choose to share with us, bringing that to a wider audience. A language hotspot, just to remind you, has three characteristics. First of all, it has very high language diversity, and that means not just a large number of languages, but actually a large number of language families. Secondly, a hotspot has high levels of language endangerment. Many of the languages in a hotspot are endangered and likely to disappear. 
And thirdly, a hot spot uh, has high low levels of language documentation. That means that many of the languages have not yet been studied or documented. Um, and thank you for that comment uh, from Alder that Peru may have more languages than Bolivia. That's absolutely correct. Um, so again, we're interested in language diversity at the level of families. We're interested in language endangerment, and we're interested in languages that have not yet been documented. So I would like to invite you now to come with me on a virtual tour of four language hotspots around the world. We're going to start out in Siberia, then we'll go to Melanesia, then we're going to come to the United States, to the state of Oregon, and then we will end up back in India where we started. In each of these hotspots we're going to see different scenarios for language endangerment, different reasons why language diversity is valued, and different strategies for people who are saving their languages. I want to start in Tuva, a place that's very dear to my heart. When I was in graduate school at Yale, I told my professors that I needed to go live in Siberia for a year so that I could write my dissertation. And so I went to live in Tuva. But I also had a kind of hidden agenda, which was that I was fascinated by nomads. I wanted to live in a nomadic society and understand it from the inside out as a participant. So here I am in Tuva uh, as a young graduate student living in a yurt well, with a yak herding family. And they figured out, I think on the first day of my stay there, that I had really no useful skills um, in a nomadic society. I don't know how to herd goats or how to um, uh, take care of sheep or things that are important in a nomadic society. But I wanted to help out, and so I was given the task of collecting yak manure. Now, these are the yaks. You see them on your screen there. They're furry cows. Uh, they go out and they eat grass, and there's no other source of fuel in the environment except for the poop, the manure that the yaks produce. And so I would go out and follow the yaks and collect the poop. And through this very humble task, I learned that they had different names for this product at each stage of its development. And so I begin to appreciate, through this simple task, the richness of the Tuvan lexicon. Now, probably the best introduction to Tuvan culture that I can think of would be for you to hear Tuvan overtone singing, or also called throat singing. This is a remarkable vocal art where Tuvans are said to produce multiple notes at the same time from a single person's vocal tract. So I would like you to hear this young man, his name is Marat, and he's performing the art of Tuvan throat singing. <laughs> So that was Tuvan throat singing. It's a really remarkable, beautiful art. They say anyone can do this, so if you're interested, you can look at some videos on YouTube. What interested me as a language learner was the song lyrics. And song lyrics are a wonderful entree into any language. And so I began to listen carefully to the lyrics of Tuvan love songs. And I heard in Tuvan love songs a phrase my liver aches. It's a common phrase in a Tuvan love song to say that my liver aches. And it took me a little while to understand, but Tuvans regard the liver as the seat of emotion. Now we in English have a different metaphor. We say that emotion resides in the heart. Both of those metaphors are biologically false because actually emotion resides in the brain. But both metaphors, the liver, and the heart are very powerful culturally. And so I begin to understand how languages through their metaphors can interpret the world differently. 
Another challenge I faced in Tuva was learning how to say go. Now this is something that you want to learn on day one of learning any language, but it turns out that Tuvans had five different words for go, and I would try out different words and people would either laugh at me or they would correct me, but they couldn't explain to me what the system was. In order to choose the word for go, you need to know something about your local environment. So I would like all of you attending the webinar now to think for a moment about the local environment that you are in and see if you can identify where the nearest river is in relation to where you are sitting. Think about where that river is. Okay, now that you've thought about the river, you also need to know what direction is the current flowing in the river. And based on that information, we're going to add two more pieces of information, which is are you going on foot or are you going by some means of locomotion? Based on all of that information together, you're going to arrive at the Tuvan word for go that you would use in a particular circumstance. Are you going with the current, against the current, or across the current, and are you going on foot or by locomotion? So it's a very complex system that is embedded in the local environment. Now, if you are going on a journey in Tuva, it is customary to consult a shaman or a shamaness or a fortune teller, someone who communicates with the spirit world and who can advise you whether it is an auspicious day to travel or perhaps you should stay home instead. And in talking with Tuvan shamans, I began to notice an interesting way in which they spoke about time. Whenever they talked about the past, they used a set of body part metaphors relating to the forehead and to the nose. And when they talked about the future, they used a different set of body part metaphors relating to the scapula and to the spine. So it turns out that Tuvans think of the past as being situated in front of you in space where it is visible. The future, Tuvans believe, is behind you. It is sneaking up on you. You can never see it. So it's impossible in Tuvan to say, I'm looking forward to next week. In Tuvan, you're looking forward to last week, and next week is behind you. So again, through this different mapping of a space-time metaphor, Tuvans apprehend the world differently. Now, eventually, my host family taught me enough skills that I was able to advance from collecting yak manure to assisting with goats, and goats are a central element of Tuvan life. This is a photo of my host family caring for their goats, which provide cashmere and milk. And working with the goats required a whole different vocabulary, so I'd like to play a small video clip. These are my consultants, my host family, teaching me some of the 24 different names that they have in Tuvan for different colors and patterns of goats. I see we have uh, um, Aziz Akhmedov from Turkey joining us, and so if you speak Turkish, you will recognize some of the words you just heard in the Tuvan because it is a Turkic language. Now this system of 24 names for colors and patterns of goats is not just a lexicon, it's not just a vocabulary, it's a technology, it's a taxonomy, it's a hierarchical organization of knowledge, and it's an adaptive technology that has allowed the Tuvans to survive in one of the harshest climates on earth. So language contains not only knowledge and vocabulary, but technologies of how to do things. Now I had gone to Tuva with the best possible training in theoretical linguistics. Uh, from Yale University I knew the international phonetic alphabet. I could make an accurate phonetic transcription of any word in any language. I could break a word down into its morphemes. I could draw a syntax tree showing you the structure of a sentence. 
Those are all the tools that we learn in modern linguistics. But those tools turned out to be inadequate to understand the grammar of a language. Now in linguistics, we're taught that all you need to understand the grammar of a language or to explore the grammar of a language is a single speaker. And you can sit in a room with that speaker and ask them questions and extract the grammar of the language from their head. And then you can write a descriptive grammar. This turns out not to be true. Um, languages are deeply embedded in the environment in which they're spoken, as I've been talking about. And so it turns out that language is not contained within the brain. It spills out of the brain. It is capacious. It encompasses landscapes, rivers, plants, metaphors, time and space. And the knowledge base, the things that we don't know we don't know, such as a taxonomy for classifying goats, exist out there in the world, but are eroding. So that's Tuva. We've been in Siberia, a rather cold place. We're going to go now to Melanesia, a very warm place in the South Pacific, to look at a language called Panao. Uh, Panao is a very small language. It has fewer than 500 speakers, and they all live in a single village which means that they all know each other and they all potentially speak to each other. So this is a language that is located in a very bounded area and it has a maximally dense social network. All the speakers potentially interact with each other. Uh, nonetheless, it is highly endangered and likely to go extinct. Panao is spoken in Papua New Guinea. And when my team and I first visited this village um, in 2009, we were taken immediately to meet the eldest and the most expert speaker. His name is Joe Mawab. And we explained our project, and we were given permission to carry out our work. And then we began interviewing Joe. And the first thing we do when we come into a village uh, with a language that has not been documented is we want to collect a simple list of words. So we will conduct an interview. And we began asking Joe how to say various things in the language. How do you say dog? How do you say tree? And so forth. And this interview session very quickly became a really vibrant, um, exciting community participation effort. Everyone wanted to help. We had people watching through the camera, listening through the headphones. Uh, they were carefully watching my phonetic transcription, even suggesting corrections, even though this is an unwritten language. Um, and whenever we asked Joe how to say something, everyone would call out the answer. And the women who are standing just outside, because this is the men's house in the village, it's a restricted area for women, but they were standing just outside the windows, also listening to this dialogue and contributing their knowledge. What impressed me about the Panau community was that they immediately grasped the value of digital technological documentation of their language, and they were eager to carry out this project. They also had what I thought was a quite surprising request in 2009, which was they told us that they wanted to see their language on the internet. Now, at this time, as far as we know, no one in the Panau community had personally seen or used the internet, but they had heard about the internet in 2009, and they knew what it was. They had a sense that it was a global informational medium, that it was powerful, that it was multicultural, and they also felt that there ought to be a place in the internet for their language, the Pinal language. So we were very impressed by this. And with support from National Geographic Society, we were able to raise some funds. And we sent Danielle Barth, an American graduate student from the University of Oregon. And Danielle uh, went and lived for almost a year in the Pinal community. And she worked with expert speakers such as Kadagoy Rawad, shown here doing the very painstaking work of collecting thousands of words and sentences in the language. This is what field linguists do, and we love it. Uh, we also, because I believe in reciprocity, so we always, as part of our research projects, we don't just go out to study some community and their language. We always bring experts and speakers from these communities to the United States, where they can receive training in language documentation. So we brought Rudolf Raward, uh, a young cultural activist from the Pinal community, to the United States. And I would like you to hear directly from Rudolf his answer to my question. It's the same question I ask everywhere I go in the world. 
it's quite simple actually. I always ask, what's happening to your language? So this is Rudolph's answer about what's happening to the Pinao language. Looks like there are about less than uh, 500 people who speak Pinao, and um, young people um, don't speak Pinao. We speak Pidgin, which is a common uh, language in, in, in Papua New Guinea. And so uh, it's, it's, it's like uh, ch children under the age of 10 uh, would never speak a language at all. I know there were some issues with the video, so I'll just recap what Rudolph said. He said that uh, people under the age of 10 are no longer speaking the language, uh, that they are speaking Tukpisin, which is the national language of Papua New Guinea, and they're also speaking English. And this is a phenomenon that linguists refer to as language shift. It's very common in immigrant communities in the United States, Canada, or Europe, where people move from, say, Poland or Vietnam, and they come and live in the United States, and the older generation speaks the, the ancestral language, Polish or Vietnamese. Then there's a middle generation that is bilingual, but usually by the third generation, the grandchildren will be monolingual in English. They will have made a complete shift from speaking their heritage language over to speaking English. This is a natural process. Um, but in the case of Polish or Vietnamese, the consequences are not as dire if it stops being spoken in a particular family who has immigrated because there are millions of people elsewhere speaking these languages. In the case of Panau, if this language shift progresses to completion, the language will vanish entirely because it's not spoken anywhere else. One of the things Rudolph did when he came to the United States was he sat down and in about 30 minutes he did something quite remarkable which was to design a writing system, an orthography for the Pinao language which had never before been written down. Now Rudolph is a literate person, he speaks, reads and writes English and talk Pisin, but his language Pinao had never been written down so he had to solve some phonological problems to figure out what symbols to use and he produced this beautiful book, uh, the first book ever in the Pinal language, which is his autobiography. It's called I Am Rudolph. It has his photograph on the cover. In this book, he talks about his community. He talks about getting on an airplane and traveling to the United States. This was a very traumatic um, event for the community because they had never had a member of their community get on an airplane and fly across the ocean. And so as a precaution, they conducted a ceremonial funeral for him before he departed, just in case he didn't come back. Uh, fortunately, Rudolph did come back to his community, and he brought with him copies of the first book ever published in the language. He also created some beautiful digital stories that are up on YouTube. Now, linguists like to look for patterns. That's what we're trained to do. And so one of the really interesting patterns we noticed in Panau is something called reduplication. I believe reduplication is a linguistic universal because every language I've looked at um, seems to have some form of reduplication. Reduplication is simply where you repeat part or all of a word for some special semantic effect. Um, and so uh, Panau has reduplication and we began noticing words like mui mui or metalek galek or Bak, bak. And we wondered, what does reduplication mean in this language? What is its grammatical function? What does it do? Well, it turns out that reduplication in Pinao represents living, wiggly things. So things that are alive and wiggly. Bats, lizards, centipedes, honeybees, and so forth. This is a really cool pattern. It's also something that you can't ask a native speaker about because this is tacit knowledge. But as a linguist, you can look scientifically through a corpus and discover these patterns. Now, in 2010, the Pinao community got electricity and they got a very slow internet connection and we purchased a laptop computer for them to use. 
And so the first time that they were able to visit the internet, which they already knew about, they had been hearing about, but they hadn't seen it yet. The first time that they visited the internet, they were able to hear the voices of their elders speaking their language in the Pinao Talking Dictionary, which we had created. This is potentially a very important moment in the life of the language. Here we have a language that is not being used, it's being abandoned by the youngest members of the community, and now they can see it in a very technological setting. They can appreciate that their language is just as good as any other um, on the internet, and that it can be represented. It does have a place in the technological world. And so this is something that can help send a message of support and encouragement to this community for keeping their language. Many small languages and language communities around the world are eager to cross the digital divide. They currently have no presence on the internet, but they're eager to have one. And this is something that our organization, the Living Tongues Institute and National Geographic Society have been supporting for a number of years, helping small languages cross the digital divide. And these are communities that understand technology is not a threat to their existence, but rather is a great opportunity for them to achieve a global presence. And finally, the kinds of patterns that we find in any language, each language, no matter how small, how seemingly insignificant, contributes to science, to our knowledge of what possible human languages can look like. Without Pinao, we never would have known or suspected that reduplication can be used to represent living wiggly things. And so this is a wonderful contribution to the sum total of linguistic knowledge, and every language brings something like that. Okay, thank you for staying with me. We've been in Siberia, we've been in Melanesia, now we're gonna to come to the United States, to the state of Oregon to look at an extreme case of language endangerment, the Siletz language, a Native American language that currently has one fluent speaker and a small number of very enthusiastic learners. Oregon was a language hotspot. It had dozens of Native American languages, but it also suffered colonization and genocide, and in a space of just 50 years, from first contact with outsiders to total subjugation of the cultures, and the Native Americans were pushed onto reservations. They lost large percentages of their population, but many of them are still there. The Siletz people traditionally lived on their land. They hunted, they gathered plants, they wove baskets, and they still do all of these things. Bud Lane, shown here on the left, he doesn't like to be thought of as the last speaker of the language, but he is the only fluent speaker of the Siletz language. He's also a singer. He's shown here chanting and singing in the Siletz language with his daughter at the Smithsonian Folklife Festival. He is also a cultural expert. He wove that hat, that basket that his granddaughter's wearing on her head. He made that drum that he's shown playing. He does all of these amazing cultural things, and he is a living repository of the Siletz language. Now, the Siletz have a very strong language ideology that I would like to share with you, and this is directly from their website, where they say, quote, our language is as old as time itself. For countless generations, our people lived out their lives speaking our words. In all that time, our words were never written. They were carried in the hearts and minds of our ancestors. They were learned by each generation and in turn taught to the next. This statement emphasizes the antiquity of the language. It is ancient. It belongs to that place on the Oregon coast. It emphasizes the ownership of the language. It is our words. It emphasizes the orality of the language. This language was never written down. It was only carried in hearts and minds. And it emphasizes their emotional attachment to the language. And also shows the key to survival, which is generational transmission. I think this is a very powerful statement uh, from the Siletz tribe, and I wanted to share that with you. Now, Bud Lane, who is the fluent speaker of the language, sat down with linguist Greg Anderson and me and very patiently recorded 14,000 words in the Siletz language. This is a monumental linguistic task. And we created the Siletz Talking Dictionary, which is 
uh, available online. I'd like to play a sample entry for you now. So I don't know if you heard that, but that was uh, the word for baby basket laces. And here's a cultural photograph that shows you what the basket laces are and how they keep the baby from falling out of the basket. Now, I've been talking to younger members of the Siletz tribe, like Carson Viles. He's shown here on the right. And he tells me, he tells me that he sends text messages in the language. And I was surprised to hear this because um, there aren't very many people in the world who could understand a text message in Siletz. Uh, but also, it's not a really great language for text messaging because it has really, really long words, and it doesn't have the nice abbreviations, the LOLs that we like to use. But this is a sign of vitality of the language, that even with just a small number of speakers, people are sending text messages in the language. And Carson also told me that they have debates, sometimes even arguments, in the community center about adding new words to the language. Should they borrow the word computer from English, or should they invent a new Siletz word that means brain in a box? The Siletz, even with just a small number of speakers, they like to invent new words in their language for technology. And this, again, is a sign of vitality of this very small language. So lessons I've learned from Siletz is that there are no hopeless cases. Even with only a single speaker, and a small handful of learners, you can have something like a language revitalization program. You can do new things with a language. You can invent new words. Another lesson from Siletz is that linguistic ownership is real. This is a very hard concept for speakers of English or major world languages. Nobody owns our language. You don't need permission to learn it. But the Siletz own Siletz. It is their intellectual property. When we first built the Siletz Talking Dictionary, they told us to keep it under password protection. And they said, no one should access this dictionary except our enrolled tribal members. And we said, no problem. We kept it under password protection. And for five years, they kept it as a private resource. At the end of that time, they wrote us an email and said, you can take away the password. We're ready to share this resource with the world. And that had some wonderful consequences as well. And something as simple as text messaging, any kind of technologizing can help to elevate and sustain a language. So we've been in Siberia. We've been in Melanesia. We've been in Oregon. We're going to come back now in the remaining 10 minutes or so of this presentation to India to Koro, the language that we all greeted each other in at the beginning of the talk. And I, I'd like to just say that greeting to you again. It was Kaplaya. Kaplaya is the Koro greeting. Um, now, Koro is a hidden language. Why was it hidden? It was hidden because it was not recognized by the government of India. Uh, it was not recognized by the state authorities. And even locally, it was not recognized by the people who spoke it as being a distinct language. It's spoken in the extreme northeast of India, next to Bhutan. The Koro lead a fairly traditional lifestyle. This is a wonderful photo of Abamu Degio, the woman who sang for you at the beginning of my presentation. She sat for a portrait by National Geographic photographer Chris Rainier. You see the portrait there. It was published in 2009, I believe, in National Geographic magazine. And I brought back to Abamu a framed copy of the magazine. And I said to her, thanks to you, Millions of people around the world now know who you are. They know your name. They know the name of the Koro people. And they know something about your culture. And we were all moved to tears by this moment. And it showed what a powerful platform National Geographic can be for cultural survival. And it showed how people in these communities, when they choose to share their culture, that can have powerful positive effects. One thing that has protected the Koro language up to now is its extreme isolation. It's spoken only in six villages. Three of them can only be reached by go crossing a river and hiking back into the jungle. But increasingly, roads and bridges are being built, and young people in the community are going down to major urban centers. 
uh, for education. And so as technology comes in, these communities are increasingly connected. The Coro community is now very active on Facebook and other social media. And we were surprised to find Coro because we didn't know it existed. And we had gone into the area to study another language, a language called Russo. Uh, Russo, we knew something about it, although it hadn't been recorded before. And we had been working on Russo for about one week when the people said to us, they said, have you heard the other dialect of our language? And we said, no, we haven't heard the other dialect. And so my research team and I, shown here, uh, they said, go down to this specific village, and when you get there, you will hear the other dialect of our language. And they said, it's just like us, but a little bit different. They hold their tongue a little bit differently. They pronounce a little bit differently. So I would like to play for you two sentences. The first is from Russo Aka, and this is the language that we were there to document. And the second is from Koro Aka, the hidden language. So the first sentence is coming from Russo Aka, and I'll just play that for you. So that's he vu gyudze. It means these three black pigs. And now let's listen to that same sentence in the Koro Aka language. So tilele makala. That sounds very different, doesn't it? You don't need a degree in linguistics to know that these are not dialects. In fact, they're as different from each other uh, phonologically, morphologically, syntactically, as English and Japanese are. And so here we have a case of a language that even locally, even the people who spoke it said, oh, it's just a dialect, it's not very different. And it turned out to be very different. And so with Koro Aka, we can add one to the known number of languages spoken in the world. This is very exciting, not only for science, but for the Koro community itself, whose language is now recognized globally. Now, the Koro community also have very strong feelings and thoughts about why their language matters. And I would like to play a short clip by Anthony Deggio, a young member of the Koro community, explaining why his language is important to him and why it should be preserved. It's me, Anthony Deggio. Uh, I'm an Indian. Uh, speaker of Speaker of Koroaka language, uh, I would like to say some few few points about the uh, Koro language. Why the people of why our this Koro language is going on in extinct. Uh, as far as the uh, Koro language is concerned, uh, most of the for uh, families to send their childhood. Outside the, outside the, outside the village to study for for, for a higher study, so uh, they could not use that mother mother language. That is Koro, and the, when they came back to the village, they don't know how to speak the language uh, mother own lang mother tongue. So due to the lack of that mother tongue, mother la uh, mother language, people of the village, some of the people of the village should, uh, started assisted them. Not only that, but also uh, when a when a when a young girl or young man, a young boy could not speak a Koro language properly and people used to mock mock at them. So it is a saying that it is a saying that loss of culture is loss of loss of culture is loss of identity. That means if we lose our culture then suddenly we are losing our identity. So we must not we must continue our uh, choral language, continue our uh, continue our this traditional traditional customs and languages, and follow the ancient our forefathers for, for, for forefathers teachings. So Anthony is giving a very powerful statement there about why his language matters. It connects him to the ancients to the ancestors. He's also giving his linguistic biography. He is one of those children who at a very young age was sent 
a great distance away from his community to live in a boarding school. In that boarding school, he was well-treated, well-educated, but he did not have the opportunity to speak his language. And when he came back to the village, he didn't speak it perfectly. People made fun of him and he lost his confidence and he began to stop speaking it. And I think he articulates very well that culture, loss of culture is loss of identity. If they lose their language, they're losing their identity as people. So lessons from Cora are that we still don't know how many languages are spoken in the world, approximately 7,000, but many more languages like Cora are waiting to be noticed by the outside world. Um, sometimes we have tricky questions about whether something's a dialect or a language. Koro is a clear case of something that is not a dialect, that is, is a distinct language. And globalization has positive effects. Here is a small language that was never before heard outside of, outside of a few remote villages in the Himalayas. It now has a global audience and global impact. I've been very fortunate in my travels for the past 20 years and my research to meet amazing people all over the world. Um, I refer to them as language warriors. They are literally fighting to save their languages. And I've presented some of their stories to you today. Bud Lane is saving the Siletz language in Oregon. Rudolf Raward is saving the Panao language in Papua New Guinea. Abamu Degio is saving the Kora language in India. And I'm so thrilled and excited when I get a chance to meet with these people. And because I work with National Geographic, I often have a National Geographic photographer accompanying me. And they take these beautiful cultural photographs. Here's a photo of Sangay Nimisau, a member of the Koro community, dressed in ceremonial dress. Uh, but you would only see him like this twice a year. And so I asked my photographer to take an everyday portrait of him. Here's what he looks like in his everyday appearance. And he is also a young language warrior. He and his friend Kandu Dagio, also a member of the Koro community, have come up with their strategy for saving the Koro language, and I would like you to hear that in closing. <laughs> So this is indeed hip hop performed in the very endangered Koro language. These two young men are language warriors. They're saving their language by not only keeping it, and they don't need it because they speak five other languages, but they've decided to keep it and also to do something creative and virtuoso with it. This is how you save a language. Now, I know I don't need to convince this audience of the value of language diversity, but I would like to remind all of us that no culture has a monopoly on human genius, and we never know where the next brilliant idea is going to come from. As I've tried to show in my presentation today, different languages provide different visions of the world, different pathways, different metaphors, different understandings of reality. And so if we care about intellectual diversity and solving some of our common human problems, we should care about linguistic diversity. This connects in a positive way to the work that you all are doing. I know many of you are ESL and EFL teachers. You are expanding your students' minds. You are giving them the gift of bilingualism. Your students are not going to be giving up their other languages in favor of English. They're going to be expanding their linguistic repertoires. And this is a great gift. And so I want to thank all of you who are EFL and ESL teachers for the work that you are doing to increase linguistic diversity. Right. In thank you your so students. much, David. Um, that and was I'll close wonderful. By simply and saying thank you all for joining. Also means I do see some you. questions, David. I'm just going to volley them to over to you. Um, one from Sanjaya. It was dialect changes every 45 miles. Is that correct? Is that true? Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
That's a great. Well, um, it depends. Um, dialect in Vanuatu, where I work, um, you have a shift of language every every three to five miles, um, and so it depends on the geography. It depends on the social networks and the social distance. Thank you. I would say it's that's not a strict rule, but it's certainly possible to find a dialect change every 45 miles or even much less. It's actually a mystery. We don't exactly know why there's so much dialect diversity and so much language diversity in the world. And much of it is as yet unexplored. So thank you for that question. Uh, you, I see a question from Mashur Imtiaz. Uh, would like to know about the Talking Dictionary. You can go to our website, talkingdictionary.com. Dot David, org. one other talking question that came through org. here from Camila was, how many we languages could provide this disappear platform in the for near free, future? And it has been very generously supported by the National Geographic Society. We provide it for free to um, endangered or threatened language communities who want to create a presence on the internet. Half of the world's languages could disappear in this century. That's a prediction. It's not as solid as we would like it to be, and it's also not inevitable. I hope I've shown today that it's not inevitable that a language, even in a severe state of decline with only a few speakers, it doesn't have to go extinct. And all over the world, there's this amazing movement for language revitalization. These language warriors that I have presented today are saving their languages through technology, through song, through dance, through the arts. Um, all of these things are interconnected, whether it's textile weaving in Oaxaca as a way to save the Zapotec language, or it's traditional dancing in Kalmykia to save the Kalmyk language. There are many strategies and pathways, and language is woven into everything people do. So it's not inevitable that half the languages will go extinct. Another great question that just came through but here. If um, how can you convince native speakers to share their language? Big languages and the attitude that small languages are inferior prevail, then many of these languages will go extinct. So we need a shift in people's attitudes. We need to uh, learn how to value uh, small languages, and then they will survive. Yeah, that's a great question, and um, I, I don't convince anyone. What my team and I do is we go visit a community, and we simply present our work. We say, this is what we do, this is what we offer, and we ask them, what's happening to your language? And we ask them, what would you like to do with your language? How can we help? And different communities have different requests. Some communities want to see a book in their language, the first book in their language. Some communities want to see the video recordings of the elders telling the traditional stories, the creation story of their people. Um, some of them want a talking dictionary, and some of them don't want any help at all, and then we move on to another community. So um, we work with communities that welcome us and that want to collaborate with us. Someone said, where's my next project? I'm working in Vanuatu. Vanuatu is a very small country in the South Pacific. Wonderful. A lot of people Thank haven't so heard much. of it. Thank you so much, Dr. David It is Dr. the number David one Harrison. language Thank hotspot you all for in the world. So I just want to let you all know the um, image of the book here. This is one of David's publications. But it has uh, if you want to say anything more languages. Languages. to it, I'm just going to put so the been link in, in Vanuatu the chat box right now for everyone. And it's a fascinating part of the world. Wonderful.
Thank you, everyone, for joining. Just a Thank few you so much last to all notes of you as we wrap up here. Work that you're we do doing have a survey the following world. this webinar. We'd as love said, to hear your feedback. Um, We're so glad you could join us and take an hour out of your very busy schedules as English teachers. Your languages. Um, and, uh, I do want to let you know we are running a wonderful event called Learning Moments for Teachers of English for the month of October. We're actually asking you to share with us some photos of your everyday life and let us know how you'd use these in the classroom. We'll be highlighting a few of our favorite shots on our websites, on our blog, and so definitely be sure to participate. We'd love to see a picture from where you are in the world and hear how you can use photography for learning in your classroom. So please do take some time to do that. We'd love to see your shots. All right, and the link is uh, in the slide right now. I'm just going to type it in the chat box as well, as well too. And as many of you probably know, we do offer several webinars for teaching young learners, teaching adults of English, teens as well. We have some coming up, so be sure to sign up on our website if you enjoyed the webinar today and would love to come back for more. We'd love to have you. And be sure to follow our InFocus blog for Teachers of English too and connect with our community. Thank you so much and thank you again, David. All right. Bye, everyone.